Thank you very much. Um, thanks. I'm Giovanni Rico. I'm a postdoc at the University of Zurich. Um, I'd like, first of all, to thank the organizer. Um, it's, it's great to be virtually there. Um, and I hope in, the, in some of the next edition to be able to join you physically there in Cordoba. So today I'd like to speak about uh, the bionic effects on the large scale structure of the universe. Um, how can we quantify these bionic effects and why they are important? So bionics, um, um, if we take the large scale structure of the universe, at very large scales, gravity is dominant. Um, so uh, bionic effects are uh, negligible. But if we go to smaller scale, then the then, gas uh, pressure. Yep. You cannot see my screen. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. okay. So if we go to smaller scales, um, um, astrophysical effects, for instance, um, the, con the cooling of the gas, the galaxy formation, AGM feedback are no longer negligible. And we need to take into account them. We can, uh, for instance, um, quantify them by running a pair of simulation one hydrodynamical simulation, so like with all these baryonic physics and astrophysical processes, and a twin simulation where uh, all the hydrodynamic is switched off, so just gravity only or dark matter only, and compare them. So we run these two simulations and uh, we measure their uh, matter power spectrum and we take the ratio. And this plot is showing the prediction of different codes and different uh, group works about this, uh, this difference in clustering. And as you can see, different hydrodynamical simulations predict very different bionic effects. So at large scales, so at the left part of this, uh, of this plot, since we are in Fourier space, these are all converging to one. So gravity and hydrodynamical simulation uh, agree perfectly. But at smaller scale, we have that qualitatively, like similar shape of these bionic effects, but quantitatively, very different uh, outputs. So these are difference in more than 50, 60%. As you can see, there is like a suppression at medium scales given by the gas that is pushed away from Helos and an enhancement of the power spectrum that is a very small, a smaller scales given by the galaxy formations. And um, this, um, but to, to know really the, the impact of these baryon effects is important, for instance, for uh, weak lensing surveys. As Marianne already introduced, these weak lensing surveys um, measure directly the impact of all the matter, not, not a bias tracers, but just all the matter that is integrated. For instance, uh, if, we, um, if we assume that the galaxy shapes are uncorrelated in the skies or are just randomly oriented, we can expect that there will be a given correlation caused by the large, large scale structure. So like we observe very far galaxies and the, the light is distorted um, by the potential of the, of the large scale structure. And this introduces a tiny correlation of 1% signal that we still can measure and infer some cosmological parameters. For instance, the dark energy equation state or the amplitude of fluctuations, or the quantity, uh, the density of, of matter uh, in the universe. So this is a very important cosmological probe. And um, the correlation of the uh, shape of this galaxy, as we can see in this, uh, in this equation, is uh, equal to the integral in the redshift or moving distances, or some kind of lensing kernel that is just a geometrical factor, times the power spectrum of the matter. So all the matter. Uh, is intervening in this kind of uh, calculations. And if we see the correlation, we can even do a tomographic approach. So get different redshift beams and cross correlate them. And we get some signal as this one in this plot that is from the dark energy survey collaborations. And we see like that we have this galaxy shape correlation in, in different redshift beams. But the problem is that in this power spectrum, uh, are intervening also baryons. And we really don't know what is their effects. And as a matter of fact, in the dark energy survey measurements, like all these gray bands here are like the part of data that is thrown out, thrown away 
from the collaboration because of the impossibility of, of modeling these bionic effects. So a large fraction of, of, of data is currently not used because of theoretical reasons. So we cannot really model them. And therefore it's very important to come up with some kind of modeling to, to be able to exploit this data. And for future surveys, this is gonna be even more dramatic since uh, Euclid or LST are planned to have like uh, to be uh, to have very precise um, uh, uh, very precise measurements, and they plan to get the dark energy equation state with an accuracy of one percent, and therefore we need to be to have a, a power a matter power spectrum precise to one percent up to very small scales, and in this work by Schneider and others in two thousand twenty try to quantify what, what would be the error if we don't, uh, don't consider these variants. So if we do consider variants, we have these blue contours here, if we have perfect knowledge of the baryonic effects. If we uh, ignore completed variants, we would get these black contours. So these are five sigma bias in uh, sigma eight, so in the amplitude of fluctuation in the universe and in omega matter, the matter density. If we we do consider bionic effects, but we don't know exact, the exact model. So we marginalize over them. We are gonna, we get these red contours. So we're gonna miss part of information, but still be unbiased. And if we do like the dark energy survey and miss and just throw away all the small scales where these bionic effects are more important, we throw away uh, a lot of the information and we get these gray contours. So doing this model is very important. And here we propose um, to model them with uh, the BCM, or baryon correction model, or also baryonification. This was an algorithm that was proposed first by Schneider and Tessier in 2015. And um, the idea is to model baryonic effects in post-processing on top of embody simulations. So you uh, run gravity only embody simulation, and afterward you put baryons. So before baryonification, you will have all your ELOs that can follow, for instance, a navarro franke white as we've seen before. It's just a normal parameterization for dark matter ELOs. Whereas uh, after the baryonification, you introduce different components of baryons. For instance, you can introduce a, a central galaxy or a, a, an hydrostatic equilibrium gas, this, this red uh, line. And you can assume that a fraction of the gas is expelled from, from the halos. That is like this part, this green line is the density profile of this ejected gas that is going beyond the viral radius. So you compute analytically these uh, density profiles um, according to some, um, some theoretical prescription that will depend on some physically motivated parameters. And then after you compute this analytical profile, you displace the particles in the halos of your simulation to match these new profiles. So after you bionify your simulation, you will have different bionic fields in your simulation. As we can see in this, uh, in this plot, in the top left uh, parameter, uh, in the top left panel, you would see like the dark matter only simulation that is before bionification, but after bionification, on top of the dark matter, you would have also some bound gas, some, some gas that reside inside halos, some part of the gas that is ejected from the halos, is this uh, bottom right panel, whereas you will have also some galaxy um, field. And this bionification is uh, much quicker with respect to run um, a full hydronomical simulation, so uh, an hydronomical simulation can take millions of CPU hours, whereas to baryonify simulation, you can take a few seconds up to uh, one minute or, or so, depending on the size of your simulation. So this is very quick uh, and accurate, but uh, in order to be used, for instance, in an MCMC analysis with hundreds of thousands of, sim of evaluations, this is still slow. So what we propose to speed up this kind of analysis is to build emulators and in this case with artificial neural network. So the scheme of, the arti of this neural network is the following. You have like different layers. The first one is an input layer where you put as an input the cosmological parameters. The last one would be an output layer where you have, for instance, your matter power spectrum or the bionic effects on the matter power spectrum. 
And in between, you have several hidden layers. So in each of the hidden layers, you have um, a number of neurons. And in each neurons, you, you will apply um, a nonlinear activation function. And uh, all, the all the neurons in each layer is fully connected to the, the neurons of the previous and the next layers. And in each of these connections, you will apply a weight. So what the network does is to, um, to minimize the weights in all the network. To, so to change, uh, optimize the, the weights in the network to minimize a given function. So uh, th that is called the loss function. So you uh, run a huge training set. So like some cosmological parameters for which the network knows your model. So your, the matter power spectrum given by your simulations with baryons. And then um, all these weights are minimized in order to, for the network to learn the mapping from the cosmological parameters and astrophysical parameters in this case to the matter power spectrum. So after we, um, we do the training on the network, we get some percent accuracy on, uh, on our network. And we can go and try to, to see how it performs our, uh, our neural network against the hydronomical simulation. So we try to collect the largest set of hydronomical simulation we could get. So we get a, a set of 74 cosmological hydronomical simulation. Um, so we use also Bahamas, Cosmo Owls, Owls, um, Elastris, Elastris TNG, Eagle, and, and we try to fit them all. And, we, and using our full model of baryonification, there's seven parameters. As you can see, we can get an accuracy of 1% in all their power spectra. And we try also to strip down our model to see like what's the minimum amount of, of baryonic parameters we need to describe this clustering. And we see that even with just one parameter, which is like the quantity of gas that is expelled from, uh, from a characteristic yellow mass, we see that still like we are a few percent uh, accuracy to most of these hydronomical simulations. And Two minutes, uh, Joan. Yes, Sorry. yes, yes, I'm done, thanks. So, and we also published our, our neural uh, network emulators that are available in this website. And just to conclude, uh, bionic physics is poorly known, and this is the dominant systematics expected in current and future with cleansing service. So we propose here to model it with, um, with a baryon correction model. This to be applied on post-processing of gravity simulations, and then to train neural network emulators in order to speed up by order of magnitudes the analysis of, uh, of, of in the pipeline. And we see that this, uh, this method is very, very fast. It's millisecond evaluation for one model and still accurate enough to fit at percent level the very expensive biodynamical simulations. And um, thank you for the attention. And if you have any question, I'm, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you, Giovanni. You can take a show. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, I want to make a comment because uh, you only mentioned the effects of uh, baryonic feedback, but in colder matter, let's say cosmology. But uh, for example, I mean, I, what I would like to hear in this kind of talks also is that uh, these problems clearly degenerate with the assumption of the cosmology you are assuming. And also because uh, you ask people uh, a bit warmer uh, kind of particles, you may uh, release tension that is only paid by the baryonic feedback. Therefore, this, this problem has to be generated. And last comment is that, um, for example, in the case of the smaller structures, uh, when when stars are not uh, producing high ratios, and uh, then uh, baryonic feedback negligible respect to dark matter only, and we know that uh, in these small scale uh, galaxies we have the, the 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 tensions yet with cold dark matter, right? And baryonic feedback only cannot uh, solve. So if you can comment on this last uh, point. Uh, 
I will, sure. I will appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the comments. Um, I, if I, I I answer also a, a bit on the first first point, which is uh, totally on point. So um, the degeneracies between cosmological parameters and astrophysical parameters are there and are important to model. And actually, I didn't mention it just for reason of time, but in in the approach I'm following, you have both modeling of cosmological and astrophysical parameters at the same time. So for the cosmology, we are using the cosmology scaling algorithm of Raul Angulo and Simon White 2010. So this is uh, allows you to, in post-processing, to displace the particles of your simulation in order to follow the cosmology, like to mimic the, co um, the cosmology of, of another set of simulation run with an, a different cosmological set. So you can effectively um, model the cosmology in post-processing in your simulation. And so we, in, in our emulator, we are, we are changing both cosmological parameters and astrophysical parameters and fully capture all the degeneracies between these two sets. As the second one, uh, I, um, I agree in the matter power spectrum, different halos contributes in different way in the matter power spectrum. But in our simulation, we are, um, so in the matter power spectrum, actually the halos that matter the most are ten, uh, halo of 10 to the 13 solar masses, 10 to the 14 solar masses. So, uh, but with this baryonification approach, you, you parameterize the dependencies of the baryonic effects as a function of the halo mass. So you should capture all these differences in, of baryonic effects in different halo masses, even though they should be degenerate, of course. Okay, thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Um,